Welcome back to One Hit Wonderland, where we take a look at bands and artists known for only one song. Folks, I am not a sophisticated man. I listen to and review pop music, the most popular and accessible of musics. I am a lazy listener. I just don't have the patience or interest in any of that artsy, experimental crap. And yet sometimes, in defiance of my limited tastes, the two will intersect anyway. Yeah, you know this one. Bunch of you didn't think you knew it, but you do. Once upon a time, in the middle of the most pretentious, black turtleneck and sunglasses wearing part of Europe, two conceptual artists started a musical project. They called themselves Yellow, and they were not particularly looking to become pop stars or have a hit song. And you could argue that they never did, at least in this country. Their best known single, Oh Yeah, never quite cleared the bottom half of the Hot 100, so technically it wasn't a hit song. Arguably, it's not even a song exactly. It has none of the structure of a pop song, no chorus, no verses, not even really a riff or a musical phrase. It's just a clattering assortment of beats, bass, catchphrases, and random mouth sounds. We're well past the EDM revolution now, so we're used to it, but imagine how weird this must have sounded in the mid-80s. And yet, thanks to a couple key placements in a few hit films, this eclectic collage of sounds is one of the most instantly recognizable songs of the entire 1980s. And in a supreme irony, this band that had zero interest in commercialism became the soundtrack of yuppie 80s materialist hedonism. Anyone who has ever lowered their sunglasses to better demonstrate their sheer, unchecked, selfish desire has had this song playing in their head. The fact is that Yellow were a lot more than one overused soundtrack joke. Their work is so wild and varied across multiple media that several books have been published about their works. Those books are very expensive and in German, so I didn't read them, but I am going to do my best to pay tribute to one of the most willfully bizarre acts ever to hit it big. Oh yeah. Day bow bow. <laughs> This, I think, is the first video that Yellow ever made. Bostitch. It's what the whole Kraftwerk, Krautrock sound was turning into right at the turn of the 80s. This is cool, I like this. But these guys, who are they? Well, why don't we start even further back? We will eventually hit every country in Europe on One Hit Wonderland, and today we've got a new pin to put in the map. Switzerland! The land of yodeling, incomplete cheese, a largely unused but surprisingly intense civilian army, a nation of no artistic importance, if you believe Orson Welles. They had 500 years of democracy and peace, and what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. That's actually very important, I'll have you know. A cuckoo clock is a strange noise-making machine, and strange noise machines were the inspiration of one Boris Blank, who, even as a kid, just really liked making random noises with his tape recorder. Not songs or music exactly, just sounds. He liked all the avant-garde noise artists like The Resonance, the really early electronic artists, you know, just the deconstruction of music. Eventually, he built up a giant library of random sounds that he mostly created himself, and he turned it into a musical project with a guy named Carlos Perón, whose only credited instrument is tapes. I have no idea what that means. I like to believe he just banged VHS tapes together. But they weren't quite complete yet, till they met this guy. This is Dieter Meyer, and this guy is nuts. Every article I could find about him starts with his insane resume. Concept artist, millionaire industrialist, professional gambler, member of the Swiss golf team. For what it's worth, I saw at least one article that suggested that this was all probably bullshit. But upon further research, it seems to be mostly true. He comes from a rich family, as do most successful artists. His dad was a banker, and he seems to have just leaned into it, judging by the fact that every picture I've seen of him, he looks like the Monopoly guy. Honestly, comes off as almost like a parody of a rich weirdo. The more I found out about him, I kind of expected to find out that he owns an eccentric chocolate factory or something like that. And you want to revolutionize the chocolate well, market. Uh, and I started with my first small factory, they now all have to agree that the product is outstanding. And 
your dad was a banker, you make chocolate. Is it possible to be too Swiss? Well, in any case, he'd already made a name for himself in the late 70s as an artist, and according to his website, his art was stuff like a film showing where you just sat and held a blank sheet of paper in front of your face for two minutes. That kind of thing. But he was getting tired of that whole scene when he met Boris. Now, Dieter just wants to try everything. So he's like, you got a music project, I can sing. And Boris was like, my pure genius vision would be ruined by even a great singer, which you ain't. But the two just had simpatico sensibilities, so we wound up joining the band anyway. So you got these three guys who all look like side characters in Casablanca making avant-garde art music. They called themselves Yellow because they wanted a short, punchy name like Lego. Most big websites operate under the same principle. The thing to understand was that they were not intended to be listened to like your average pop song. Let me say that this stuff is a little obtuse. Or at least it is if you were only listening to Hall & Oates at the time. Or even a lot of the new wave acts. Those guys still use recognizable choruses and lyrics and stuff. There are these early electronica songs with a whole lot of pump-up energy behind them. The lyrics are all kind of like spoken word pieces. Yellow weren't as avant-garde as their influences, like Kraftwerk and stuff like that, but it's still pretty out there. The closest one I heard to an actual pop song was called Pinball Cha-Cha, which appears to be some kind of Mexican-themed parody of Pinball Wizard. But their stuff was very popular in the early days of MTV, back when basically all music videos were experimental art projects. Yeah, this stuff is definitely in its own genre, in that I literally don't know what to call this kind of music. I mean, they're not synth pop because they're not pop, or even really necessarily synth. It's got some similarities to house or dance music, but you can't really dance to it. I don't think techno existed as a term yet, but that's probably the closest. Anyway, Carlos went solo after the first couple albums, leaving them as a duo. And the odd thing is that as their career continues, you can hear them starting to become a little more accessible. It's not like their sound changed, it's more like the 80s caught up to them. Like you can hear a lot of the sounds they're making filtering through the songs that came after them. Like the Pet Shop Boys especially seem like the accessible pop version of Yellow. Or even like the later Leonard Cohen stuff too. And the two of them just have like this interesting dynamic. Boris is this intense perfectionist artiste and Dieter is a flighty weirdo who does this for fun. And the songs just kind of go wandering into random places that was clearly different from the original idea. I don't want to make them sound too off-putting. Their music isn't ugly or random. These sounds all go together. It's just that no one had done it before. Now these songs were all kind of catching on in the Deutsche Sphere, but their big breakthrough was to come. A breakthrough called Ferris. Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while. You could miss it. So the year is 1986. John Hughes makes one of his masterpieces, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Like all John Hughes movies, it makes great use of music. You may or may not know the English beat's March of the Swivelheads, but hearing it will always bring up the image of Matthew Broderick racing through backyards. Both Don Cashane and the Beatles version of Twist and Shout are now definitively owned by Ferris Bueller. But the biggest song launched by this movie does not belong to Ferris. It belongs to Ferrari. The 1961 Ferrari 250 GT California. <laughs> The thing about this scene is that it is not actually very memorable on its own. It's not like the shots are especially amazing, or that it has any big lines of dialogue, or any big showy acting moments or plot twists or anything. The thing that makes it memorable is just that song. Hey, remember? This was not like a single before this. Like, it's not really the kind of music that typically shows up in John Hughes movies either, so I have no idea how it wound up on his radar, but it just fit the scene so perfectly. The entire emotional climax of the movie doesn't make sense unless you believe that, that car is the hottest, most precious object that ever existed. I don't know or care a damn thing about cars. To me, that's just another car. But I absolutely believed in its hotness because of yellow slick beats going, oh yeah. Hughes must have realized he'd found something special because they play it again over the credits. It is just so instantly memorable from the opening beats and then just the lowest bass you've ever heard. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 
And now that I've listened to the full Yellow discography, it's really different from their other songs. I guess you wouldn't call their work very lyrical exactly, but they are very wordy. Oh yeah is the exact opposite, it has almost no words. <laughs> Dieter wrote the few lyrics it has as just like a starting point. And he had a whole bunch of other lyrics too, but Boris was like, nah, we're good. The funny thing is that even though this is the Ferris Bueller song, if you look at the single cover, you'll notice another movie listed on there too. The year after Ferris Bueller, there was a big Michael J. Fox movie, The Secret of My Success. People don't remember this one as much because it's crappy and bad, but at the time it was basically just as big as Ferris Bueller. Like, Ferris Bueller's Day Off made that song. But I think The Secret of My Success is what cemented it in people's minds because it uses the song in almost exactly the same way. It's the scene where he's checking out his boss's wife right before they bang. It's essentially identical. Luxury car, a woman's body, you know, basically the same thing. And that's how the song has been used ever since, to showcase some fancy material object and or sexy person and or sexy dog. You got 10 minutes. There's no other way you can use it. No song has ever meant one thing like this one. It means, oh yeah. And that oh yeah is not, oh yeah, that's some Excellent needlework, Karen. Where did you learn to embroider like that? Now, it's clearly appreciating something very high-end and expensive. And not the classy kind of expensive either. You can't, you can't use it to mean, Oh yeah, this Sauvignon Blanc is especially crisp this year. No, that oh yeah is expressing appreciation in the most crass, sweaty, leering, gross way possible. Oh, yeah. Like, if you look at the lyrics, it's about appreciating the sun and the moon? <laughs> that sure doesn't seem like what it's about though. That only feels right if he means the sun and the moon are providing good lighting for a girl's ass. I mean, you don't even have to be told to know this is the sound of someone jerking off. I mean, it literally uses the sounds bow chicka wow wow. I mean, not in that order, but they're all there. <laughs> See? Deconstructing music. With just a handful of words and beats and nonsense sounds, they truly captured something about culture in the 80s. Because it's just absolutely insane how materialistic that decade was. Yes, yeah, so there's no time in history when people weren't trying to make and spend a lot of money, but the extent to which it dominated culture in the 80s is just absolutely staggering to look back on. So this song is what the 80s sounded like. It's sexy, and it's luxurious, and it's also kind of repulsive. Boris said he imagined a fat little monster making this sound. And that's exactly what it sounds like. This is the sound of Jabba the Hutt and or a bald fat guy having a midlife crisis. And look, personally, I just have a soft spot for songs that become the stock soundtrack for certain story beats like this one has become. I'm talking like, we are the champions. Let's get it on. I feel good. I'm too sexy. These are songs that capture a specific mood so perfectly, they're just too on the nose to even use. Oh yeah is like that. Nothing has ever come around to replace it because nothing sounds like this. What drum track has ever been as instantly recognizable? When has bass ever been used that well? Oh yeah may last forever, but it also captures a very specific moment in time. They were not a band designed to have a long career with a lot of pop success. There was no way they were ever going to follow this up. Right? Yellow were one of those one-hit wonders where you can't really say the follow-up failed exactly. The follow-up couldn't fail because having a big well-known song was just a side benefit to begin with. That's not how they defined success. They were not that kind of band. But also, their follow-up was very successful. See, Oh Yeah was off their fourth album, Stella. The album got some good reviews, some of their songs started showing up on Miami Vice, they moved on to the next album, and there's some interesting stuff on there too. Their stuff was starting to get a lot moodier and more atmospheric, including a cool duet with James Bond theme singer Shirley Bassey. But by that point, the secret of my success had happened, Oh Yeah started taking off, and in America, the label added Oh Yeah to that album too. And that's when the song jumped to the Hot 100. And then they followed up that album with their biggest pop hit yet. By 
by pop hit, I mean in Europe only. But, you know, just measured by the charts, this song, The Race, is their biggest hit. Maybe even their signature hit. This was a top 10 hit in three countries, including the UK, where it seems to be at least comparable in fame to Oh Yeah. He's going the distance. And it's definitely their most pop friendly song. I mean, listen to that. My God, it's almost funky. Now keep in mind, this does not mean Yellow sold out by any means. This is still not structured like a pop song. It's a bunch of cool ideas slapped together. Swinging brass, Hawaiian steel guitar. It's pure mood music. And in this case, the mood is racing energy. From what I understand, this became the official soundtrack of Euro racing for years. This is like the least likely band in history to make a jock jam. I mean, look at them. But they did it. In America, they remained one hitters. But you might remember this song popping up on that big hit movie, Opportunity Knocks. Yeah, we all remember that one. Hello, greetings, my name is Dagla. Comedy classic. And it also uses it to introduce a fancy car. Maybe they thought, oh yeah, was too obvious by that point. Somehow this movie didn't do for them what Ferris Bueller did. Oh, they made a ton of music. They can't be stopped. I couldn't even possibly start summing it up. Like, they fade out from chart success after the 80s, but they've made seven more records since then. Most of them haven't garnered much attention, but I don't think either of them particularly cares. Some of those records are more down-tempo. Some of them are as wacky and weird as ever. Electronica moved on towards rave, trance, newer genres, and newer artists that they inspired. Meyer invested his oh yeah royalties in various businesses, so he can only do music in between his billion other activities, like directing music videos, his various tech projects, designing watches, his restaurant, the aforementioned chocolate factory. I also assume he's an international art thief, ninja warrior. In 2016, they did their first live shows ever. That seemed to go pretty well. If you're into experimental music, by all means, check them out. Well, in terms of deserving more commercial success, no, that's a stupid question I'm not gonna answer, who cares? But in terms of recognition, yeah, I think they do deserve better. <laughs> I hear all the time about various other early synthesizer one-hit wonders like Devo, Gary Newman, even Thomas Dolby, and how important and influential they are beyond their one hit. I've never heard anything about Yellow except for their one song. And yet they seem to be very important on the influence of synth pop, electronica, dance music, even hip hop. I get the feeling that they've never quite gotten their due respect. Well, I'm gonna give it to them. Oh yeah. Influential electronica. Beautiful. Bow, bow, 